We're live. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Tolka, for getting us live. Bella's here, too. I don't know if you can still see Bella. Hi, Bella. It's Tolka's daughter. Uh, welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel on this Sunday night. It's a fine night. You might notice that I am wearing a shirt with buttons on it for the first time in, I think, like five months. Judy said, no, we have to go out someplace. I don't care where, but we got to go someplace. So I actually put on a shirt today. Um, Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight we have a man of great imagination, great persistence, and great energy. Matt Harbison is going to be telling us about how five years ago, when he weighed 165 pounds, <laughs> he looked up and he says, you know what? I'm going to build me a mosaic of 200 pieces, and it's going to have the littlest galaxies, and everybody's going to be able to see them. And he's going to come and show us how he did all that. Uh, but first, I'm going to show you a few things. Um, the first thing I'm going to do, I think, is uh, tell you about a problem that I had. Let's see. Mute me. Um, and uh, where am I going? I'm sharing my 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 uh, lap my screen here. Do, 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 do. Present now. My entire screen. Click share. And then I'm going to jump over to our calendar because I always like to tell you that Michael Keefe's going to be here next week from Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. And he's going to tell us about uh, EAA uh, because an awful lot of people are getting into EAA now because with the COVID uh, virus on us, we can't go out and do the same kind of outreach we used to do. So a lot of people are doing this. And I'm very proud of the fact that the, in the Wall Street Journal, the Riverside Astronomical Society was mentioned along with the University of California, Riverside, and that's my club, the uh, Riverside Astronomical Society. We do a outreach uh, monthly and we were mentioned in the Wall Street Journal. So that, that and it's all because of EAA. And that's one of the things Michael's going to be telling about us about next week. And then we've got uh, um, September with uh, telling us how to how to do some science with our rigs. Uh, AAVSO, Stella Kafka is going to be here. And uh, then we're going to be talking about the Green Bank Telescope for a while. Uh, Linda Thomas Fowler, one of our own. OK, she's going to be here and she's going to be telling us uh, beyond the Hubble palette, how do you get stuff out of your um, narrow band images beyond that? Then Carrie Ann's going to be here. Uh, Carrie Ann's been here before and she's uh, quite an accomplished presenter, a pod um, nominee or winner. And um, she's done a lot of cool stuff. I don't know what she's doing exactly in that this particular adventure, but uh, she's going to be here. AstroPixel processor. I know a lot of people are using that. We're going to hear about that. And Andrew Cam Campbell is going to be taking, uh, talking about creating dy dynamic images. He's coming to us from Australia. So that'll be over the next little while. Now, we try to keep six to eight weeks ahead on all of this. And you can see that we, you know, we're all the way, we're good till October, but we need several of you to hit that contact button and tell us what your name is and sign up to come on in and join us. Anyway, Matt's going to be here. Um, I want you all to get on over to this side, see this right-hand side over here of the of the presentation, and make comments for us. Okay? Um, yeah, it's your club, and say hi to your hi to your folks and your buddies in the in the Astro Imaging Channel Club. But um, also ask us a lot of questions. There's going to be a lot of good questions to ask for for um, Matt because he's done a lot of work over the last five years on this. There's some places you can see um, for subscribing, and I think we're up to nine and a third thousand. My goal is to get to ten thousand so I can quit talking about it every week. There's some places for you to contribute and things like that. Now, there's one other thing that isn't here. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, oh, I don't know where it is. Uh, let me see. Is it back over here? Nope, it's not there. Um, oh, well, let me just tell you, um, and let me stop sharing my screen. Um, last, um, stop sharing. Um, where am I going? Boink. Um, we decided to... Um, um, get everybody together and send us their Neowise pictures. And we put the, uh, the, the show together last week and everything. And it was really cool to see all of them. But a couple of things happened. One is the guy who was putting together the show goofed and he got all the, the pictures from 
the Facebook page, but he forgot to pick up the pictures that were sent individually outside of the Facebook page. Well, we fixed that and we uh, corrected the NeoWise slideshow. So now it's six minutes and 19 seconds. We've added about, oh, 45 seconds to it. And some of you who weren't in the show last week, that's because you didn't send them into Facebook, you sent them into me directly. Um, they're now, it's all in there and all of your pictures are in that. I think we got everybody. If we didn't, I'm sorry, we'll have to do it again sometime when NeoWise comes around again. There are some other maybe celestial event, okay? Okay, that's enough about all the preliminary stuff that we like to do around here. Don't forget to hit your comments and questions in and to like us and subscribe to us. And most importantly, to have a good time with Matt because he's up for a good time. All right, Matt, tell us who you are and what you did with your, with your last five years of your life. Well, thank you, Alex, and thank you, um, Astro Imaging Channel, for having me on, and um, hello, world. <laughs> so uh, five years ago, I set out to do something different at the time. Um, I absolutely love astronomy, and I thought um, I could do something that no one else was doing. Uh, so I set out to do a large mosaic of the Orion constellation and all my life. Uh, the Orion constellation has kind of followed me around. It was one of the first constellations I remember um, seeing as a child. Uh, the symmetry of it kind of stuck in my head through Boy Scouts and as I would travel, um, I'd be at the beach or driving home from college or driving to school in high school. Uh, the Orion constellation seemed to stick out and um, I followed it around and uh, I spent my adult life chasing it with telescopes and looking at it and viewing it. Um, and at some point I decided I wanted to see it a little bit different because it's one thing to look up in the sky and to see those tiny dots of light, but it's quite another thing to take your telescope and, and really uh, be dedicated in one area. And I think that's one thing that mosaics provide. Uh, they give you a look into an area that you might normally, you might not normally see. Um, these are some mosaics that I've shot over the years, uh, Cygnus Loop, California Nebula. Um, then you've got uh, over by the North American Nebula and um, Crescent Nebula there at the bottom right. Uh, Ro Ophiuchi, um, Elephant's Trunk, Mosaic of the Moon. All of these are mosaics, by the way. They're all shot on my um, five and a half inch refractor, 132 William Optics. Um, this row here is a nine panel mosaic. And um, the the giant panorama of the Milky Way there is, a, I want to say, a 12 panel mosaic. And then a couple single shots along the bottom. Um, that is the courtyard of the Marathon Motel in Marathon, Texas, one of the most magical places you can ever go or ever visit, um, it really, the Milky Way stands out that, that, that way with the lights. It's just extremely dark. And then you've got a, a meteor shower on the, in the center there uh, with Orion front and center. And then, and then another picture of the motel sign at the Marathon Motel with the Milky Way backdropped behind it. And again, um, little tricks, that is a couple tricks to take that photo, but uh, that's a real photo. <laughs> and here's a giant, um, grouping of my images over the last, oh, seven, eight years, I guess. I've chased the stars, our star, you know, neighbor stars in the neighborhood, you name it. I've pointed my telescope at it. And every time I take a new picture, I'm amazed at what's over us. It seems to me that, as, as Carl Sagan said, it, it truly is um, a character developing uh, hobby. And uh, it's, it's an amazing thing. So here's some pictures of all of my uh, society friends, um, my, my best friend Dennis Sprinkle there, who uh, is always with me when I'm out, and uh, I, the, all, several members of the Barnard Astronomical Society, um, staff members of the Marathon Motel, Sky Park, um, Dalton State Community College and their observatory. We went to Neef a couple years ago. Up in the top right-hand corner, you see Dennis Sprinkle eating sushi in Alpine, Texas, uh, maybe maybe dangerous. I don't know. I don't know how, how close is the closest ocean there. Um, probably not close, uh, but Dennis loves sushi. 
then the bottom left, you see our outreach with our society. And in the middle there, you see the observatory at the Marathon Sky Park. And um, these are just some great images of all the fun I've had and have been fortunate enough to be a part of. So tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about what a mosaic is. So it's not just taking one astronomical Im image, it's taking many astronomical images to put them together. Um, it's a system of process, it's, it's a process of systems where you just continually try and fail and continue to try. It's, it's not, a, not something you just step into lightly. Uh, I, I highly recommend anyone um, thinking about doing mosaics to start mastering your equipment before you um, delve into multi-panel mosaics. There are certain things about astrophotography you need to understand and astronomy that you need to understand. And, uh, and I've had wonderful teachers through my astronomical society and friends. And, um, you know, with the Internet these days, it's just amazing all that you can learn. So here you see uh, in the top left a picture of my society out with our ice fishing tents. Uh, pro tip, everybody, if it's 10 degrees outside and you have one of these in a the little buddy heater, uh, it doesn't get so cold. So we learned this trick a while back. Um, and so we park our cars there and put our warm tents, all of our, we our warm room essentially, and our telescopes outside. And it is the game changer to be able to stay out when it's five degrees outside. Uh, in the center there, you see an image uh, of, a tel of my telescope. Uh, I use the 70 millimeter uh, Williams optic star there as the God scope. And I'm using a Canon 100 lens, millimeter lens and an Attic 383 camera uh, to do my first mosaic work. And then the two on the right are tests of mosaics. So in the bottom, I tested a 178 um, ZWO camera with a 50 millimeter. And, and this was in 2014. This was kind of as I was getting started in mosaics. And I was thinking, all right, well, I want to do some mosaics. I want to piece some things together. What's the best way to do it? Well, use the equipment you have, obviously. Uh, but there's certain things you need to understand about your equipment. And, um, and, and chief among those is essentially... Um, how it's laid out in terms of your pixel scale. So on the left, I have just a simple image uh, that I found online that just illustrates what a telescope image circle is in relation to a sensor. And this is something that a lot of people don't think about. Your sensor, uh, it might not cover the circle of the telescope. And so you really have to be careful when you pair up your sensor with your telescope to ensure that you get complete coverage around the scope. And and when you're doing mosaics, this is key, because if you don't get a flat field and if you don't get it covered completely, you end up with pinch stars on the end and they trail off um, or they just don't look like they should. Um, and then you end up trying to crop and you end up cropping and cropping, and cropping to the point where uh, you probably just should have done a single image. Um, but on the right, you see a list of the different sensor sizes. And I'm going to talk a little bit in a little bit about why I chose the camera I did and the telescope that I did. At any given time, I think you should take inventory of the telescope and the camera that you have at your disposal. You need to make sure that it is essentially a good fit for the telescope. You can't just go and pair up an iPhone with whatever you want to. Although, some amazing people are doing that. And I, you know, I should say, I shouldn't say never because I'm amazed every day uh, looking at social media, some of the amazing images out there that are coming in. Uh, but at the top, you see, I've listed a, 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 a Celestron Edge 11. I've got a, a, a typo there and a 0.7 reducer, which is a Celestron's uh, reducer they sell for it with a QHY 168 camera with a pixel scale of 0.5. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. In the center there, I have William Optics 132 with a 0.8 reducer, QHY 168 uh, with a 1.33 uh, image scale, and the William Star, William Optics Star 71 with a QHY 168 2.95 uh, image scale. Now, there's one more that didn't make that cut there, and uh, it's there, the Canon 100 millimeter with an Attic 383, which is 11.14, and I'll tell you why that's listed there. So you see these four images. They're all pictures here of um, Barnard 33, the Horsehead Nebula. I think that's right, Barnard 33. My brain's fried. So here's an image of um, Barnard, the Horsehead Nebula with a Canon 100 millimeter lens and a QHY 168 camera with a 9.86 image circle. Now, 
um, that camera that is listed there, that is incorrect. It should be an Attic 383. So um, I believe that's 9.86. It actually might be, I think it's 12. That math looks wrong to me. So the pixel scale with a 383 would be 12. But this is the image size you would get. This is the actual image shown full screen. You see the resolution you have. Here is the William Star 71 with a QHY 168 and an image scale of 2.95. You see your actual framing. Here is a William Optics 132 with a 0.8 reducer, a QHY 168, or a 16200, very close uh, in pixel size there, and one at a 1.33 image scale. Um, and if you put an Attic 383, that's going to push it up to about a 1.5, somewhere in there. And then finally, you see a Celestron Edge 11 with a 0.7 reducer. Now, obviously, you can tell the resolution here is key. It's keen. Uh, it's wonderful. Look at the look at those tight stars. Look at that wispy cloud cover inside the the Horsehead Nebula. And these are all shot. All four of these shot images were shot in Tennessee with a probably about a Bortle four sky. But right away, you can see the difference in resolution between these images. And this is what you're going to base your decision to do a mosaic on. You can decide um, if you want to go really wide field, you know, many, many degrees, or if you want to do something a little tighter or even tighter. Um, and I did this to say, uh, pick what you want for the first time, do it correctly. So when I initially set out to do my mosaic, I started with an Attic 100 and a, an or Attic 383 in a Canon 100 millimeter lens. Um, it gave me a pixel size around 12, I think. I'm pretty sure it's 12, if, I'm, if my math is right. Um, and here is an image that you get an idea of what the what the makeup of that that um, that combination um, was. And now you'll notice the stars are pretty tight to the edges. You're not a lot of trailing stars. And and because I'm going to need to crop, you you always crop before you do a dynamic background extraction on your data. But here you can see it laid out, and you can almost see the entire constellation in 12 panels. So um, I processed this one, and this is the resulting image. And I was very happy with this image. This image, um, it's a 12 panel mosaic at, at 10 to 12 pixel scale. You can definitely see the horse head nebula. You can definitely see. Um, the M78, um, you can see uh, the Boogeyman Nebula, Orion's front center, all kinds of stuff, which is head up in the top right. But for me, as I looked at this, I thought I can do better. Um, and I wanted to do better. So, um, and, and there you see it on the cover of the Reflector magazine. I was very happy with that accomplishment. Um, this is one of the many image nights that we would go. If it was a good weekend, we would try our best to stay out as long as we could. And we would take turns with staying with the equipment. Somebody would drive back home and, and, and do whatever they had to do and work. Many of us would have to go back to work on Friday and, you know, you'd just sit there through the day, be halfway awake. Um, but you can see that front passing and uh, that's the Cumberland plateau in front of my truck there. And then uh, at the bottom, you see me shooting the actual mosaic. So here's my 132 with my QHY 132 or QHY 16200. After I finished this image, you see on the right, the, the Constellation Orion 12 panel mosaic, I decided I wanted to shoot it deeper. So I went after M78 and I did IC434, Barnard, uh, the Horsehead Nebula, and then I did M42, um, single images, but it just wasn't enough. I wanted more. I wanted the entire Constellation. And that's when I decided to get serious. And I started doing some planning and some thinking and research, trying to figure out what kind of software would even allow me to do this. And the answer was none of it. Well, that's not entirely true. It would let you do it, but you had to really work around things and find, and find uh, resolutions for problems that you didn't even know you had. Back in 2014 and 15, I think the most framing, the framing of Mosaic Wizard had just come out with SGP or maybe an hour, maybe a year before I got to it. Um, and it would do, I believe, Jared, don't kill me, maybe like eight, eight to 10 panels at the time. Um, I, in my, in my travels across the USA, I've been fortunate to meet one of the developers of SGP. Um, and Jared is in the observatory behind me, which I'll get to later. But here you see a single image, um, 
taking my one with my 132. And I got to thinking, you know, I can do this. And so I set out to do an eight panel mosaic with my 132 refractor and my 16200. And there's the result of that eight panel mosaic. And I was in love. I looked at this resolution and I knew that I had to do something bigger. And so I set out to do not just eight panels, but to do um, 200 panels. And here you can see it laid out, the four panels. Now, no software did this. I had to overlay on top of it at the time, and I found ways to do that. So <clears throat> the, uh, the biggest part of all of this, of course, is your equipment. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about equipment. Now, here you see a group of telescopes um, in the Permian Basin in Marathon, Texas at the Marathon Sky Park. You want to know why? The Marathon Sky Park has amazing skies because it's a bowl. <laughs> and you can see that bowl right there in this image. Uh, but there's several members of my astronomical society. And there's I, I apologize to the few folks who got cut off up at the top there. But uh, I know that's Dennis Sprinkle and David Frost and Peter Shinovsky and Ralph McConnell and uh, Patrick Sick. And um, I'm forgetting some. Jim Swigers in there somewhere. But lots of folks have gone out there on these trips with us and we just have a blast when we go. But here you see all kinds of telescopes. You see short telescopes, you see long telescopes, but these are all refractors. Um, having been in marathon now for uh, close to three years, I can tell you that uh, refractors out there just, it, it's, it's much easier than trying to use a cat um, or a reflector. Now you might think I'm a little too attached to my reflect, my refractor telescope and, and, you know, I'm not going to deny that. I do love my refractor. In fact, I have two of them. Um, I decided at some point that, hey, I'm going to get two and do twice the imaging and half the time. Um, it really doesn't work out like that. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, So for considerations of your telescope, budget, obviously, um, there is no reason why a reflector telescope can't do everything you want. In fact, I would say the reflector is the best uh, the best telescope to start with. Now, you're going to have to learn how to collimate, which is important to do. But you can get a really nice reflector telescope in the in in the area four to to six hundred dollars, and and that's expensive. But this is equipment, and it's not just a toy. It's if you take care of your equipment, um, it will hold value, and it will be an heirloom. So, uh, you want to think about your light gathering capability. This is a place where reflectors actually most of the time beat refractors. Uh, because they 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 can really get down there with their their light gathering ability, and it just gets a little crazy when you're talking about supporting your camera and the weight. Uh, all that adds money, um, but it the reflectors are a a great place to start. So you want to think about options of support like re reducers, flatteners, autofocus abilities. Can you put an autofocus motor on there? I know ZWO these days has just about every every piece of equipment you'd want to be able to do. Um, to do uh, mosaics and, and to use a telescope. Um, but size constraints are going to be an issue, especially if you've already got your mount. I tell people to buy your telescope first um, and uh, or buy your mount first and then buy your telescope. Buy the most expensive mount you can. Put all your money there because that that is that is the most important part of your imaging uh, of your imaging um, uh, imaging train. If the mount can't push the telescope or it, it's not holding it well, uh, then it's not going to, it, it's just not going to work out well for you. And I apologize. I see all these questions over here and um, I see, I see questions about combining different arc second pixel images um, and that sort of thing for the entire mosaic. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Um, you know, Matt, it's generally easy. You're, for you to give your presentation. Eric is watching the um, that stream over there. And sure. uh, and when if there's something that he needs to interrupt you on, he'll interrupt you. But okay. otherwise, we've noticed through the years that just give your presentation and, and we'll get back to it. Okay, okay. So, sounds okay. good. Okay. <laughs> okay, so size constraints are important with your telescope. You want to make sure that your mount can hold your telescope. Um, then you have to learn how to collimate. You have to do some research, figure out if your telescope has focus issues. There's some reflectors out there that are fantastic, some maybe not so much. In some cases, you can spend an extra $100 here or $200 there and, um, and really make a big difference. And 
um, I can't stress enough, having a flat field with a telescope is, is maybe one of the most important things, especially if you're going to do mosaics. Um, I've done mosaics in the past where I didn't have my back focus perfect, and it just makes a mess. So upkeep, where are you going to store it? You're going to need a case. Are you going to travel with it? Is it going to stay in a, an observatory? All those are considerations that you have to have to think through. So then you start talking about cameras. So what kind of camera are you going to put to your telescope? Well, you want to match it. And that's where the pixel scale that I talked about earlier came in into play. And I started on pixel scale because as you set out to do a mosaic, um, you need to think about how you want to capture it. And uh, I, I started just willy-nilly, I'm going to use this 383 on this camera lens. We'll see what happens. And I was disappointed. So I'm trying to save someone from being disappointed. If you match it properly, match, match your telescope to your camera and, and know what your pixel scale is going to be, know what kind of skies you normally image in in terms of seeing and what they can support, it's just going to help you in the long run. It's going to keep that frustration down low. Um, so in my case, I ended up using two cameras. I used a 16200 QHY camera with a seven position filter wheel. Um, at the time I bought it as a five position, uh, but QHY sent me the parts and I was I upgraded it at home. Um, it, a little soldering iron and some very tiny tweezers and um, some very high magnification goggles and a member of my society, Peter Shonosky, and we got the job done. So here you see the supplies that come with QHY cameras. At the time they were, they were including the QHY um, off access guider, which was a huge perk, but the 16200 has been a really nice camera for me. I've enjoyed it. So considerations on the cameras. When I, when I picked the QHY 16200, I'm going to go back. I picked it because it had some serious real estate. I couldn't really afford a 16803, which was the largest CCD camera. And now keep in mind, when I was doing most of this research, the, the ZW 1600 had just been, it, it was just hitting um, not the market, but people were talking about it. But it was, it was unknown tech. And I'm one of those people, I don't jump on new tech generally. I, I will wait watch something be proven and then I'll get it. Um, but with the CCD camera, I had used a 383 for years. I felt confident in it. Um, I actually had purchased a 178, which one, it was one of the first CMOS cameras that kind of came out there. And I had used that and I wasn't really happy with the results that I got from it. So um, again, it was, it was kind of in its infancy, infancy. And the 16200 provided real estate with a, a kind of a proven sensor, in my opinion, since it was a predecessor to a 383. So I went with the 16200 and it worked out wonderfully. It, it was really matched uh, nicely with the 132 and, and the images that came out of it. I, I got several images of the day. Um, <clears throat> I was very happy with it, very happy with it. But considerations, budget, of course, always, um, light sensitivity, read noise, well depth, resolution, and pixel size. I'm not going to get into those specifics, um, but those are all things you need to research when doing a mosaic. And um, and it's something that you need to understand. Now, these days, I, at the end of all this, I'll tell you what I would recommend if I were, if I were building a system right now. Uh, but there's some really nice, amazing cameras out there. But be aware of your camera quirks. Uh, do some research on cloudy nights. There's plenty of forums out there these days. I don't know if you're on the Discord, but there's some great astrophotography groups there. Uh, Reddit has some great information. Astro Ben and Salvatore has done some amazing things over there. Um, it's just, there's so much information out there. It's really up to you to do the homework. Um, but doing the research will tell you if there's frost issues with the camera, if it has power issues, or if it has calibration uh, problems. Optional system accessories, always a plus. If, it, if it's got an OAG or a tilt corrector or spacers, those are amazing things. Um, Okay, so briefly, monochrome versus one-shot color. These days, I would I, I would purchase a one-shot color. Then, I, you know, five years ago, I wouldn't have. So that's why I've got a monochrome camera. Um, but I always consider the age of the tech. When I bought the 16200, it was brand new. I had no idea that it was going to be phased out some four years later, which if you weren't aware, uh, the CCDs, the 16200s were there. I, I'm not sure if someone's picked up the supply chain yet, but I think that they're phasing those out. Um, and then also camera backspacing. You need to make sure that you've got enough backspacing with your sensor uh, and your camera body to support your camera, your telescope. Some telescopes won't work with some cameras um, and some will, but you, you'll have to get creative there. And um, 
And I've been amazed at, at, at how some people have managed to uh, make things work. Now, here is an image of my two telescopes with the exact, exact same telescopes and the exact same reducers. But they, um, they as you can see from my two my, micrometers there, um, I had to use two different uh, sets of spacers to get it um, to get it uh, get the field flat. And I understand that that's because of small, small, small uh, variances in the glass and in the manufacturing. But um, the proof is in the pudding, as they say, and the images looked pretty nice. So then there's the mount. Now, <clears throat> yes, I have an Astrophysics 1100 and an Astrophysics uh, Mach 1. Did I start on those? No. If you look at the image at the beginning of the Astro Imaging Channel, I imaged with Celestron mounts for years, um, and they make great mounts. And these days... Uh, they make even better mounts, and uh, Skywatcher makes amazing mounts. The EQ6R Pro is an amazing mount. Uh, again, when I got started, there were there were different options. So uh, this was for me uh, kind of a no brainer. I had the opportunity to upgrade an 1100 uh, by simply trading a Mach One, so uh, it worked out real well for me. But here's my imaging rig in Texarkana, uh, and I was doing some solar imaging during the day. So with a mount, your considerations, again, the budget. Um, you got to consider the budget. So many great options out there now. Research, research, research. Think about the weight of your equipment. What do you want to do? <laughs> I have this, uh, one of, one of our, my, our members in our society, his name was Bill Seymour. He's recently passed away. But Bill would always set up next to me at a star party. And I had, a, I had my, my Celestron CG, uh, the DX, and it had this huge tripod. I mean, it was gigantic, right? And um, I would carry that thing out there and set it up, and it weighed like it weighed. It was like a, it, it, I, I'm a prop, maybe a ton. I don't know. It was five or six hundred pounds with everything on it. It was just heavy, um, and all kinds of weights. And I could never get it balanced just right. Um, but it, when it worked, it worked. It worked great. But so one day I come rolling in with a smaller mount, this, uh, like an AVX, like a quarter of the size of this DX. And Bill looked at me and he said, what, Matt, where is your big telescope? And I said, Bill, I, I'm tired of carrying that telescope around. And he looked at me and he said, Matt, there will come a day when you can't carry a big telescope. But until that day, you should carry the biggest telescope you can carry. So I do. <laughs> but it is starting to get pretty heavy. So uh, weight of equipment is definitely... Um, it's definitely a consideration. Travel considerations. Are you going to drive it around? Because that'll that'll wear out your car. Um, as someone who took a took their Subaru to pack their telescope in it before they bought it, I can tell you it'll wear out a car. And then what command software are you going to use? Because you'll need to consider um, whether or not your mount will work with it. So you can do some research there, but there's some wonderful command software out there. I, of course, use SGP. Um, and, and Nina is just an amazing software suite. Uh, I know he's, I, I, I know uh, Stefan's been on your Astro Imaging channel. He spoke to our society a couple of months ago. Um, just a wonderful guy. I know um, uh, there's uh, Prism over there and another another great software. You have Neb Nebulosity, just so many great things out there. Pies, Raspberry Pies. You want to build your own system and use K-Stars or Stellamate, Stellarmate or even a ZWO Air. Uh, the number of imagers in our society is growing every day and the number of them that are using the ZWO Air is uh, increasing exponentially. So that's a pretty amazing thing. But your mount is key and you wanna make sure it's stable. Cloudy nights, do your research. <clears throat> so a word real quickly on dual imaging. Now, Sarah Wager and, and some other folks out there have done dual imaging way before I did it. I think Rogelio's done some of it. These guys out there, they paved the way. I kind of picked up what they, they wrote. I think, I, I don't know if they would agree with me, but goodness, it's a pain. Uh, here's my considerations. So pro, twice the data. Con, twice the price. Pro, twice the data. Con, twice the headache. Pro, twice the data. Con, twice the equipment boxes. Con, get ready to babysit the system. Um, it, it just never ends. It is an, a continual piece uh, of, of work to babysit that mount. And here you see my images. Now, uh, anybody wants to message me later and ask how I got OAG working, um, I, I'll be happy to tell you. Um, and uh, I'll just go ahead and spoiler alert, I didn't. Uh, but I did find a workaround. So here you see what I was able to accomplish. And, and I did. I, because I was traveling, I got twice the data. And it worked out wonderfully. And here you can see me editing. 
Uh, there you can see my multiple terabyte drives as I'm just continually pulling this data down and me processing, processing and putting things together. Um, yes, those are all processes. Yes, um, <laughs> it's a pain. So um, here is my dual imaging uh, rig. This actually held both scopes. Got to have one that will actually focus on the other one. So they're both pointing at the same place. And then a, a guide scope in the center. So bringing it all together, I said all that, and, and now here's why you're here to talk about mosaics. <laughs> here is uh, just a couple of the images over the years that I've put together as I was working on my mosaic. You can see I would mark off panels, and um, I know you can see the small little piece up there, but uh, those aren't as important as these. Um, this is my journals, and these are key to every image I have taken. Um, it has the center star so that you can plate solve it. Might not sound like a big deal, but as you're processing these things, there are some tricks now that make it a lot easier. Uh, but having a star in the center that you can plate solve to really makes it easy. So um, data and data and more data and keeping track of things just, well, here we are. 100, what, this is 204 panels of the Orion constellation. And I am finished with exactly 100 and. <clears throat> 99 of them so i have a couple to shoot this season but i might just cut it off at the ends <laughs> because i'm really tired of doing this i don't know i'll probably finish i'm a pretty patient guy uh, and each one of those squares is an image that i've taken so here's here's the day here's some data you can really get inside and look in there see what's going on it's really chunky and um <clears throat> very soupy it's just amazing to think these areas are out there there's just so so much going on there. So something magical happened about two, about a year and a half into this process. I was invited by the Marathon Motel, the staff there, to move my telescope into the observatory to help them get it running. So myself and Dennis Sprinkle, another uh, my, my, my good friend and uh, an amazing astro imager. Um, if you haven't seen his stuff, it's amazing over at Rock Solid Photo, just amazing stuff. And uh, Dennis is one of the nicest guys you ever meet. But Dennis and I put our telescopes in there. And this is just a picture inside. <laughs> There's no, you know, it's just one picture. And uh, it's pretty amazing how beautiful it is there. And it's pretty amazing what you can do. Now, you'll notice I dropped the dual imaging. And here's some of my images I've taken in there, just so you get an idea of what's capable um, when you can get, image every night, just about. Um, several images of the day here, again. Uh, every red circle you see there is a galaxy um, in that image. Every blue circle you see is a galaxy in this one. Um, and another mosaic. I'm kind of hung up on mosaics, if you hadn't noticed. And here's um, exactly 91 panels of the mosaic. Um, and I did print this. I've got it hanging on my wall. It actually turned out really nice. Um, but this is where the fun really begins. And here you see one image. And eight images and eight images eight still getting a little bit bigger yes it just keeps growing so this is where i finished uh, after the first year and a half and once i moved into the observatory i started clicking away at it now you'll look at this data and think oh that doesn't look that good but none of it's processed appropriately yet but it's about to i mean i'm in the i'm in the process of building a new computer so i can process this properly um, it is as you can imagine large amounts of data a large amounts of data um, and here's the current process let's see here i'm gonna come out of this and i'm gonna share a different tab and show you no let's see if that's it no that's not it now, okay, so this is um, my current progress, and this is the luminance frame. This is all I've been able to put together, um, just simply because it's so large. So I've got this neat little bit of code on my website, spaceforeverybody.com, where you can really see what's there. But um, here's the mosaic. You can make out Orion here, and uh, I want to show you my favorite part of this mosaic for me, and I always lose it. But it is this tiny little galaxy. It's not tiny right here. Now, there is no way you would be able to zoom in on this without the resolution 
that my pixel scale that I chose affords. So my camera, my telescope allows me to zoom in here. Again, I had to shoot 200 panels to get to this, but it's there. And when the image is complete, it will be a color image. It's not just luminance. I have all uh, luminance red, green, blue um, frames uh, for the entire 204 panel. And uh, there's lots of talk about where what I'm going to do with it. And if you've got some ideas, I'd love to hear them. Uh, I want to educate people and I want people to get excited about space and education in their communities and their astronomical society. So I really don't have an agenda of, other than getting people excited about uh, outreach for astronomy and, and looking up and realizing that things, you know, things aren't that bad. We're, we're in a place in, in history where we can look up beyond the stars uh, from our driveways. And that's pretty fantastic. So um, this uh, is where I'm at right now. And let me get back over here. Hey, Matt, could you uh, take a question or two? Oh, yes, yes. Can you tell us how you put the different uh, panels together, how you overlap them, match the luminance or the, uh, the brightness so it, it looks seamless? You know, what sure. processes you use? I'm going to show you. I'm going to do a little tutorial real quick here. I'm going to show you exactly how I do that. So let me stop. Um, let me see. Let me pull up my PowerPoint again. Um, so I use software to do that. And um, the most important part of that is to um, is to start at the beginning. Whoa, we'll see. That's not where I want to be. Uh, the most important part is to start in the right place. Um, okay. So um, to do that, you've got to um, understand... Uh, Ooh, sorry, you've got to understand what you're going to be imaging. So I'm pulling up Sequence Generator Pro real quick, and I'm going to do present and a window. Okay, so you should be able to see my Sequence Generator Pro, and I have pulled up the Framing and Mosaic Wizard. So say I want to do a mosaic. So you need to take into consideration your skies. How long do you see um, Orion in your sky? So if you're in North America, pretty much anywhere in North America, a good bet is... Um, you'd be able to see the North American Nebula, okay? Um, and so you can um, type in Cygnus. I'm going to type in Cygnus because I know that's right up there. And notice I've got the field of view set to 50. Okay, well, let me try. We'll just do... Let's do... Um, let's do Orion. Let's do that. If it's in the winter, it's up there. So here's Orion. And there you can see the loop that I've been showing you all night. Now, in my equipment profile, I have all of the parameters of my equipment. I have, so I have different parameters for equipment here. I don't know if you can see this, um, but I have uh, a 128 and a 14 millimeter. I have a 168C and a 168C and an edge. And then the 168C with my refractor. And that's the one I'm going to pull up. And um, I've got everything set properly in terms of pixels of the sensor, the readout noise, and the scale that it's provide that pr that that image or that that res or that sensor and telescope provide. So, given the reducer and all those things, that is my image scale. Matt, so, if I Matt, could I interrupt you here? Yes, please do. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with the SG, SGP screen and. Um, are you looking at the equipment profile right now on your computer? I am. We aren't. Oh, okay. Okay. I think, I think what's happening is that your meeting software is show, showing one panel, one, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but gotcha. uh, it's not showing all of them. So please realize that. Gotcha. Um, okay. okay. So the equipment profile manager and the control panel in SGP um, are where you put in Things like the sensor size, the scale, the pixel size, all of those um, specifications of your equipment. And as long as you set that up properly, you can then go to the framing of Mosaic Wizard, put in a value. So I'm going to start with a 10, field, 10 degree field of view and M42, and I'm going to pull it up and you're going to notice it's going to be smaller. So then you simply drag and drop. And you can tell exactly what your mosaic would look like. So if you wanted to do a mosaic here, you could do it this way. So if you want to do more panels this way, 
or you wanted to go this way. You want to get Orion and, and um, Horsehead, you go this way. So fairly straightforward, easy tools. And again, they have these in other softwares, but SGP is where I started, so I thought I would show that to you. I will tell you just a little bit of advice. When you're building a mosaic, um, you want to be aware of your bright stars. So this mosaic right here would be a problem because this star, is that Mirnak uh, or Al? Oh, I can't remember the name. So Al Natak is right in the center, so it won't cause us too much, too much problems. But this star, because it's on a scene, will leave a, sp a, a sprite of light across the center. So you really want to get your bright stars right in the center of the frame. Because this bright star is here, it's going to bleed into this one and cause you trouble. So <clears throat> you have to learn those kind of tricks as you go. But once you do this and you hit Create Sequence, it essentially replaces your sequencer. And now your target has the exact place to start so you can sync and solve with plate solve software so you just hit start sequence and if your sequence are set up properly in your software you have your catalogs correctly listed your telescope will plate solve and move to this image rotate if you've got to rotate or to, you can set it up to manually rotate um, and if you need to manually focus you can but it will do that all automated in fact i i do all of mine automated now but i started without being automated. So that's what Sequence Generator Pro can do for you. And you'll notice the question about overlapping. You see it provides a 15 degree or 15 pixel overlap. 15% actually, it's not pixel. So that's how you make it look seamless. And you have to be careful because if you don't, um, if you don't do it properly and you don't pay attention to it and it does, and your sequence isn't set up, to plate saw before it starts a panel, you'll get a whole panel that's not in the right place. And it happens. So you just have to learn how to babysit and, um, and set your sequence up properly. But the framing and mosaic wizard, I, I, I couldn't have done my mosaic without it. I'll just say that. I mean, when I started, I didn't have enough. I, I think I could do it now, now that I've done 200 panels, but I don't think I could have done it then. Now I can, I can understand the math and the field degrees and all that stuff, but I didn't understand it at the time. Uh, but I do now. So that's SGP in a nutshell. We'll ask for questions about that in a second, I'm sure. Um, let me get back to my my um, my software here. Sorry, it's stuck. Let's see. Okay, here we go. Um. Matt, yes, Matt, sir. If you're, if you're sharing, share your whole screen. That tends to bring all the panels in together. You're doing fine now. We can see uh, gotcha. your PowerPoint. But, Do you see uh, it now? Yeah. If you go okay. back to presenting um, Sequence Generator Pro or some other program, just share the whole screen. Don't share the program. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. So there you go. The processing considerations. Um, choose a software you're familiar with. That's why I said, you know, don't mosaics aren't something you want to start with right off the bat. It'll just cause you to be frustrated. And, and let's be honest, astrophotography is already hard. Okay. Don't make it any harder. I get frustrated when I hear people putting someone down or not giving good advice or telling somebody they don't know what they're talking about. Um, I see it all happen on forums all the time. I see it happen on social media this hobby is hard, you know, and, and, and people get into it because they love space. They love astronomy. There's no need for people to make it harder and to not share information. If you know something, help somebody. Um, that's my pet peeve. I'm sorry. I'll get off my high horse. Um, choose a software you're familiar with. Learn it. Uh, if you don't know, ask questions. You'll find somebody to help you. Ask me. I, I, you know, I'm happy to help as many people as I can. Uh, ensure you have the best data you have. That's the one thing you got to do. You got to watch your stars. Uh, somebody told me a long time ago, get your stars right, and the rest of the color will fall into place. You get your star color right. If you understand how to not oversaturate your stars, how to perfectly get how to fill that well and, and put the color in those photons, fill it perfectly, you get that beautiful star color. And it makes the rest, the rest of the image falls into place. It's a pretty magical thing. I love looking at an image with a beautiful star field. You see those reds and those yellows and the blues and the golds and the whites. That's just, that's my jam. Uh, 
So a flat field is essential. Um, again, I said that earlier, got to make sure your telescope's flat. Create a naming system. Again, um, here are my journals. And I'm not kidding about this. If you can't keep dates down and write things down properly, you are not going to be able to do something like this. Um, <laughs> Adam Savage says, and he's my hero, remember the only difference between science and messing around is writing it down. And that's amazing. So I'm technically doing science because I write it down. Um, <laughs> this has been um, a process of, uh, uh, it, it's not been easy. There have been times I wanted to quit. Thank goodness I had Dennis and my society to keep me going. But uh, it's not been an easy feat to just do the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, so here's the things that I used during that time, essential books, software, and apps. Sky and Telescope, Pocket, Sky, Sky Atlas. Yeah, you might not think you need it, but you need it. Um, especially when you're trying to figure out what's near you. Um, it's beautiful when you're doing a mosaic and you find a tiny little galaxy tucked in someplace or open cluster and it happens all the time. Um, Astro Aid is on the iPhone. I love that app. Um, it'll give you pixel scale like that. You don't have to do the math. Um, Scope Nights tells you the weather. Sometimes it's right. Sometimes it's not. Don't get me started. But for the most part, it's pretty good. Stellarium. Love Stellarium. Uh, Sequence Generator Pro. Uh, love those guys, Ken and and uh, and, uh, and Jared are amazing. Uh, Pix Insight, amazing program. They've got a mosaic. Here's a little plug for your mosaic. A generator that you guys have been working on. I'd love, love to see it. I, I'm ready to use it. I'm ready to use it. Uh, APP has an amazing, uh, has an amazing processor. I'm actually going to put my data in APP too. Um, if the Pix Insight folks don't get that mosaic generator out and then Adobe just to be able to do stuff. Uh, you can keep up with my progress at spaceforeverybody.com. That's my website. It's my YouTube channel. Feel free to subscribe. Um, I'm just a guy who enjoys space and likes to, to open people's minds. And uh, I don't have all the answers. I have a whole lot of questions. Uh, I do a lot of things wrong. And then I usually learn how to do it right after I do it wrong long enough. Um, but it's been my honor to be a part here. I know there's so many other things I could have talked about with the mosaic. Um, but I'll just say this. Uh, is it worth it? Yeah. Would I use different d gear if I was going to do one today? Absolutely. There's no reason not to use a 533 or a 2600 and a Rasa 8, those two things, you could probably do my mosaic in about three months if you had enough clear nights. Um, it's just amazing what that data will do. Um, but I really appreciate being here and now I'll answer questions. Yeah, great presentation, Matt. I think we're all kind of, our heads are spinning trying to figure out whether ever in our possible life we could ever do this. And the answer would probably be, nah. Uh, can you tell us about the computing power necessary to, to <laughs> process some of this? I, I know you mentioned it offline, but I think people would appreciate knowing whether, you know, and, and how much it escalates up, say from two, four, eight, sixteen 16 panel. Sure, sure. I think, um, so I have a Mac Pro with uh, two Xeon processors in it currently with 64 gigs of memory. And it will safely in Pix and Sight put together about a 20 panel mosaic. No problem. Um, now, is it fast? No, it's going to take a couple of days, <laughs> but it'll do it. Um, and according to the guys over at Pix and Sight, um, I would need something in the ballpark of 150 gigabytes of RAM to put my new mosaic together. So I am currently building a, a PC uh, with 256 gigs, gigs of RAM and a Threadripper processor. So uh, I've been saving money for a year to build that computer and I'm almost done. I'm, I'm almost finished building it and then I'll be able to process my data. I have roughly about eight panels. I need to go back and, and, and capture this fall, but uh, it takes a lot of processing power. You can always rent power from Amazon uh, or Microsoft, they're happy to sell you a supercomputer time, um, but it's probably more economical to build yourself a computer than just have it. So for us mere mortals that perhaps have a 16 uh, gigabyte system, which in the past it seemed like plenty, how far do you think we could go before we would just crash and burn? Well, I am I know an expert, but I'll tell you in my experience, uh, RAM is cheap right now. It's really cheap right now. It's going down big time. In fact, I watched my RAM go down from January 
almost three hundred dollars from January to now. So um, if you need to buy some RAM, it's a good time to do it. Sixteen, a sixteen would be the minimum I would recommend. Honestly, with a Pixen Sight machine, I would try to get get as much RAM as you can. Thirty two gigabytes, um, and then the the multi core processors really make a difference. The more cores, the better. Uh, do you have any problem matching up the panels as far as light intensity and and what do you do about that when I mean you don't want this you know this one light panel perfectly matched to the next ones around it but not matched in intensity or what do sure. you and it how do you it how do you match that and yeah yeah so if you do a mosaic of row um, you know near Antares you're gonna contend with Jupiter and Saturn my my friend Dennis is actually do an amazing mosaic of, of row right now. It's just going to blow everybody away when he's finished. Um, but he had to contend with Jupiter and Saturn last year when he started it. Um, now, uh, in, in Orion, you had to contend with the moon, obviously, and you have to contend with those belt stars. Um, and uh, those fat stars, they, they can really cause some problems. And then they bleed into your image. Uh, yes, the background intensity it's a it's a problem so so you have things like dynamic background extraction uh then you have an uh, the abe the dbe and the abe and the pix and sitting pix inside are your two primary uh background extractions <clears throat> i've learned i do all my data kind of I, I calibrate it separately i don't i don't generally just batch it out i'll go through the weighted batch pre-processing of course they changed that over the years you know used to you had to do it all image integration star alignment all that stuff had to be separately but now they got it all um, it, it is just essentially click a button, put it in properly and it spits it out. I mean, it's a little more involved than that, but it's so nice. It's so nice to have that. And that DBE and ABE do such a wonderful job and, and keeping those backgrounds, um, right about where they need to be. But you have to take, you have to watch the, your stars. If they start getting foggy, then you're not going to be able to do a mosaic with it. Um, you really got to watch your data and you got to be, you got to crop properly. You've got to make sure you do. Um, you got to make sure you do your calibration files properly and often. And there's just lots of little things that sabotage you with a mosaic. You might be able to get away with it on one panel, uh, but you have to get to a system. You do the same thing every time. And um, I, I, everybody made fun of me. Actually, Dennis Sprinkle made fun of me for months because uh, I. Uh, I refused to update my SGP and my, my picks in sight because I, I didn't want anything to change. Um, and, uh, and, and it, it, you don't want to, you don't want processes to change that mess up what you're used to doing. So if you had to, uh, so as a beginner, where would you think people should start Two, four? I think the perfect mosaic is, um, a four panel mosaic. I truly believe a four panel mosaic is your perfect mosaic. And, and, uh, and I, I go back and forth. Sometimes I'll say six. Uh, nine is definitely not your perfect, perfect mosaic, but four or six, um, I, I, could, I could see an argument for both. But try, try two when you get started. And the best way to do that is go to, you know, depending on your pixel scale, go to um, a heart nebula with um, and uh, heart and soul. That's a good one to start with. Um, Orion and Barnard, that's a good one to start with. Um, California Nebula, really nice one. Uh, you can break that into. I, I had to do it three with my pixel scale one point three. So if you've got a three, you might be able to three pixel scale. And everybody turns it on the side. I, if you go to my Astro Bin or my Facebook page, I did my. Um, uh, actually, I'll show it to you. I did my um, my California Nebula different than everybody else did theirs. Um, I did mine on its side uh, but one or two panels is a good place to start where you won't get frustrated and you won't feel like the world's collapsed on you because the point of this is to have fun if you get frustrated it's not going to be fun but hey let me let me go a step beyond that linda wants to know she asked a while back uh for a good suggestion as to where to start and i think you answered that but how do you decide what's appropriate for a two panel mosaic on your system, you know? Okay, that's a great question. Well, so Sky Safari, if you have the Sky Safari app or Stellarium, 
um, you can put your image scale, your pixel size in there, and it will show. You can draw the box. So you just like the mo the framing mosaic wizard showed you um, what your box would look like. Those two softwares. Now, if you have an iPhone, you can do it straight through Astro Aid, or you can do it through Sky Safari. Uh, but if you don't, Solarium's on the PC. A whole lot of others. Yeah, absolutely. And you can lay it out exactly how you want it. And I highly recommend you doing that uh, just so uh, you have that peace of mind. Learning the, learning the tricks to the, the imaging software is what makes it easy. I mean, I would never drink. You can get away with a two-panel mosaic by just eyeballing it, you know. Um, but I would never try anything larger. You're wasting space, first of all, um, if, you, if you just will it, you know, kind of shoot and hope for the best. Um, if you can plate solve, you can accurately use every pixel. Um, that's why when you look through my, my, my mosaic, you could see them lined up perfectly. Um, do you have any problems matching pixel scales and sizes? I mean, you've, have you been on the same camera and telescope the whole time? I have, I have, and, and I would never, ever, ever, try and pair those. Someone asked that question, and I'm sorry if, if I gave the impression that you could move inside and outside of a mosaic with different pixel scales. You can't. That's that's preposterous. I mean, you might could try, but it just matching that data would just, it would be a nightmare. You could probably do it in Photoshop, but it's not going to be the quality that you would want. Yeah. Um, and, and you wouldn't be able to register it. I mean, there's just so many things you can do to match it um, so that it's perfect. Now, I will say this. And I've been toying with this notion. <clears throat> a QHY 128 has a has a pixel size of six, and a QHY 16200 has a pixel size of 5.9. Those are real close. So could I just shoot hydrogen data on the 16200, and then come back and shoot color data on the 128? I think I could. Yeah, I really do. Um, but there may be some. The, the, the first of all. The field of view on the 128 would be just ginormous compared to the 16200, but but I think you could do it as long as they're that as long as they match closely on pixel scale. Okay, how else are we doing on the questions, Eric? We got everything. You, you I'm can looking definitely, back through you can definitely it, register that... different image scale pictures to each other. Uh, you could uh, create a synthetic star field and register everything to it sure. and yeah you could do things like that but matt's talking about trying to do it at his uh you know with, with that image scale so if, if you have a you know if he has a preferred image scale of one arc second per pixel and your other camera is three arc seconds per pixel he's not going to get that resolution that he's looking for so exactly. right can you technically can you do it yes but like it, it, that's not what he wants to do Exactly, because you, you you know you you want to you want all of your data. Every photon needs to count. Yeah, and and so I was in Marathon a couple weeks ago servicing my telescope, and I took my Edge Eleven and my One Sixty Eight camera. And the first night, the seeing was terrible, and all of my images looked mushy. If you go on my Facebook, you can see them. The first three images I did that week, all of them are mushy. That you can just tell that the seeing was not there. The last night, I shot the Fireworks Galaxy. And I had great seeing, and it's pinpoint. It's still not perfect in my book. It still looks mushy, but it's way better than the other three nights. Um, but that pixel scale is 0.5. It's way less forgiving than a 1.5. Can you tell me how much of your data do you end up throwing out when you're collecting? So I, so this mosaic that I'm doing the 200 panel, just to throw some numbers at you, um, I shot every image of that 200 panel mosaic. I shot 30 minutes per channel. So I shot 12 images. I shot 12 images, more than 30 actually. I shot 12 images at three minutes each per channel. Okay. And then I counted on throwing two out because of something crazy. Now, sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. <clears throat> I didn't see that it made that too much, made that big of a difference. So uh, I kept it that way. But um, I actually, um, I did. Um, I did uh, um, throw out – I did have to throw out a good bit of data the year before last. Last year was a better year imaging out there. Uh, when I got out into the to the observatory out in Marathon, 
uh, and put my telescope out there. It was a game changer. I was imaging every night. You know, I was knocking down panels. I shot a total of 48 panels traveling, driving around. And then the rest of the 200 panel mosaic was all captured. Actually, I shot like 60 uh, driving, driving around. But after I started getting data from a single position, it was so good. I threw out half of the data I'd gotten when I traveled. So do you access remotely or are you physically there? No, I access remotely. I go every six months and, and service the equipment and I, uh, I access it remotely and image at night. So it's, yeah. it's all automated. I've got it set up. I got everything. I use SGP sequence generator pro and, and I just click the start button and I get my Apple watch tells me if it crashes it, <laughs> you know, I'm going to say something, uh, the, on Astro Band, people get, they beat people, beat folks up for, uh, having observatories and that sort of thing. You know, I started like everybody else. I carried my equipment around. I still carry it around. Um, and then I had the opportunity to get into an observatory. I'm just a regular guy like everybody else. You know, I'm out there working hard. I'm just looking to get people excited about the stuff. I've got no ulterior motives here. Uh, so be a little nicer in the forums when somebody's got a telescope in an observatory. <laughs> it's, 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 it can get brutal, right? Toga, yeah. you're laughing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here, here, Matt. You know, yeah. we can we can all appreciate that uh, there's somehow we are doing something wrong by accessing uh, an observatory remotely. That we've we're cheating somehow. Yeah, it's there's still plenty of headaches. <laughs> okay, get your questions in, everybody. We're gonna get ready to wind up here. Um. So get your last of your questions in. Eric's going to be reviewing to see if we've got any more questions along the way. I'm going to share my screen here for a minute now. My entire screen. And I want to head over towards, um, this is our, our NeoWise uh, presentation. Um, uh, if you hadn't seen it yet, it certainly is worthwhile. Oh, here we've got an advertisement. Well, that that Richard Wright probably got that in there. Okay, here we go. Um, Elias's uh, first show. Anyway, take advantage of this if you haven't seen it. This is not the same show that we had um, last week. It's been expanded by uh, me completing, putting in the rest of the uh, shows that were supposed to be in there. Um, and I want to thank. Oh, I want to thank um, Matt for having his um, presentation here tonight. Uh, I love your enthusiasm, man. I just, uh, you know, I, your intelligence, your your scan of what you can do. Um, I mean, I think it's funny when somebody says, yeah, yeah, it's 300 batteries less for, for, for memory right now. $300 out of, what is that, 1600 you're paying for memory? That's more than I paid for my machine, you know? So, um, you got to do. You're operating at a different scale than I am, uh, but I think that you 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 brought some some space for everybody so that everybody could see something and really enjoyed it tonight. I think we got all the questions in, right, Eric? Yeah, I think uh, they were answered along the way and a lot more. Thanks, Matt. Great job. Yeah. Great job. Uh, so Thank don't you all. Forget, yeah, don't forget to get your. Um, oh, I'm still sharing. I don't want to be sharing anymore. Um, don't forget to get your contacts in. We want more people to volunteer to uh, be presenters. Um, Linda is one of us, and she's going to be presenting in mid-September. Uh, we're always looking for more. If you know somebody, you don't want to give a presentation yourself, but you know a good imager that could share with us, remember, we've all got skills, and we've, you know, we may not think of ourselves as wonderful presenters, but we, we can all do this. Um, if you've got something you want to share, please get with us so that we can we can get together. If we want to keep this thing going every Sunday night, we got to have cooperation from everybody out there. Uh, subscribe, like, and especially thank you, Toga, for keeping us going. Thank you, Toga, and take it away. Hey, Matt, you uh, you can hang out with us after the, the end of the show if you like. And if you guys volunteer to be presenters, you can hang.